it's a rough, a rough texture, and that that uh, that can be useful in uh, in some aspects of painting. The pa the pipe is also more absorbent, so it absorbs water and allows you to do what are called wet in wet washes. Um, this is a a wood pulp paper. The more expensive handmade papers are made out of cotton, 100% cotton, and uh, the sheet, if you look at the truck painting on the end, the, that is what's called a half imperial sheet, so that's half a watercolour sheet. The full one is 30 inches by 22, and that's the handmade papers. Um, they'd be about sort of $15 a, a sheet for one sheet of paper. This pad's probably about, I don't know, about $12, $14. It's got, got um, 10 sheets on it. These are ideal for for student work. Right, uh, pigments. I use uh, Windsor and Newton. These are, these are what, what are called student grade paintings. Um, the Cotman paintings. And uh, tonight we're going to use these, these five colours. These tube, this tube's about $12 and they're about Seven dollars for this, so the pigments aren't all that, all that cheap, but it's not sort of prohibitive. Um, the thing about the pigments are is the, is that they're transparent. Or a large number of them are anyway. Uh, this is just done with one colour. Um, with a burnt umber, and uh, there's a tendency in the in the sky area where the white of the paper is left for the white of the paper to shine through the the pigment, and you can get very good smooth transitional edges and uh, a sort of a if, if it's done well a glowing effect with the with the paper being transmit. Uh, the light going through the pigment, hitting the white paper, and then back again, and transmitting some of that pigment back as a uh, as a transparent uh, type of uh, uh, with with watercolor painting. Too, there's no actual white in the in the pigments, so along the wave here, you need to. Um, what's called reserve the white of the paper or leave that part unpainted to um, give you the effect of a, of a white surf or whatever it is, uh, whatever else is that it's white there. This is a partly drawn, partly painted um, view of the same scene which is at one at a time. And uh, you can see there that I've left the, the white strip of the, of the wave. <coughs> I would then come in, if I was going to finish this, come in underneath with some, some shadow and perhaps a little bit of uh, light blue there where the wave's, wave's breaking. Again, you can see the sort of transparent effect of the, um, of the white of the paper shining through a very dilute pigment. So you need um, uh, brushes, paper, paints, and um, some form of uh, tray to mix it up. I found these these uh, trays from the two dollar shop are the, the best thing that I've found. Um, they allow you, as you'll see, they allow you to uh, get a reasonable mixing area and a reasonable amount of paint. Uh, the little tiny paint boxes with tiny, say, one inch square mixing things are, are, to my mind, next to useless for trying to do good watercolour paintings. Perhaps the, the biggest thing that I learnt was, um, it took me probably 18 months to two years, is that you need a big mixing area to make a good watercolour painting. And uh, I observed that. I, other people, I, the life drawing group, I watch people painting oils and it's, to me, um, one of the big problems they all have is that they don't put out enough pigment 
and they don't have a big, big enough mixing area or a big enough brush for the size of the canvas they work on. Okay, um, to do a watercolour, um, I, I usually work from photographs and uh, first thing to do is to make a, a sketch. You can either make a small thumbnail sketch to get the composition or um, this was one I did for, for Melford Sand and I would sketch out the, the proposed view, uh, full size, um, and then if I think I like the composition, um, then I'll trace that onto the watercolour paper. And uh, that allows you to just uh, go about the uh, painting without any concerns about composition, whether you're going to add an extra tree or whatever, it's all done on the, the original sketch. There's some sketches I made of, um, did a painting of some, some tuis I was interested in at one stage. So just a rough sketch of the bird and then uh, a possible um, configuration and then coming up with a, a final configuration that I thought looked, looked okay. Um, I actually drew out the birds, traced them, and then I could put them on the, uh, position them on the paper, and then finally draw them in. When, when I'm happy with that, then uh, trace that onto the watercolour paper, and then it's just, the only aspect then is the painting, the composition is all, all complete. Well, what I'm going to attempt to do tonight is uh, this is a this was a calendar I had in my um, studio room. Um, it's Mount Edgecombe near Cairo, and uh, I thought it would be a, a good painting for a class. And we did this. The last exercise I did with the class was this this painting. Now. There it is, a bit larger. And this is the same picture in black and white. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there's not a lot of, not a lot of tonal variation in the, um, in the painting. The whole area, this foreground area tends to look black. The mountain's slightly lower tone, but it's a, uh, Fairly pretty, it's pretty dark as well. So that that, that gives you an idea of, of tone, and the tone in this painting is uh, is not particularly interesting. So I had to improve that in, in what I what I do. Um, also, the composition, the river is pretty dominant, and uh, and the mountain is reasonably close to the centre. So. Uh, I've sketched it up and I've made a few, few changes that I think sort of possibly improve the, the, the scene as a potential painting. You may or may not agree. But it shifted the mountain uh, slightly to, to one side here, um, roughly about a third of the way into the painting. The river, rather than being very dominant and straight up, put it at a slight angle so it tends to lead the eye up through to this area of interest in here which is the, going to be the focal area of the painting. And uh, enlarge the pine trees a bit. And uh, here, just to stop the eye running off the end, edge of the painting, we'll add, a, we'll add a tree there. So this is all artistic license, this is the sort of thing you can, you can easily do. So, next thing, we'll 
trace that onto um, watercolour paper, which I've already done. Oh, yeah, just, just go through the colours. I'm going to use five colours as uh, French ultramarine, uh, Prussian blue, raw sienna, burnt sienna, and light red. Those, those five colours. Those are just from experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've got two blues, a yellow, and um, two. Well, this is a, a ready brown, and this is a red. Now, uh, with color theory, you've got um, you've got three primaries, so th those three could be primary colors. They're called a primary triad, and from those three, you can mix any any color in the spectrum. Um, so they're different. Uh, primary triads, they give you all slightly different uh, colour biases to the spectrum. But, so you can mix anything through from your purples and violets, oranges, yellows, greens, and as, as you'll see a little bit. Yeah, pigments, if you're, if you're interested after I can talk a bit about the composition of them. But, uh, the the um, sienas and uh, uh, are um, iron oxide, essentially they are forms of iron oxide and uh, it's got a gum arabic carrier as the carrier. Pigments are the same for um, whether they're oils or pastel colours or acrylics, they all use the same mineral compounds, it's just the, the binder. In acrylics they use uh, a PVA, um, oil they use a linseed oil. Um, and uh, watercolours, it's gum arabic. So I put out a dab of raw sienna. And ultramarine. And light red. So I've got a primary triad there, a blue, a yellow and a, a red. Okay, so I've traced this onto watercolour paper and uh, what we're going to do is the, uh, on this sheet I'm going to do the sky and, uh, and the river. big brush. Now normally when you do a sky you wet the paper with clear water and then add the colours. Now if I do that you're not going to see much. So what I'm going to do is um, paint the whole sheet, tint the whole sheet with this yellow raw sienna. Okay, that's what is called a flat wash. 
we just put on um, a diluted raw sienna covering there. Oh, if it goes well, this is going to be the where it gets to be the fun bit. We want to get a um, sunset type type sky, so I'll mix up some light red and uh, we'll put some clouds across. Okay, now we'll mix a, a blue, so this is the ultramarine. Mix this in with the light red. And you can see we're getting a purpley, purpley colour there. So darken in the top here. I'll dilute it down a bit and uh, come down to the horizon. Blue. Uh, watercolors dry quite a bit lighter than, uh, than they're initially painted. Right, we'll put in the uh, some reflection in here and for the uh, strain, and then down the bottom we'll put in a blue. Well, it's strange, it's more of a river. Okay, that, uh, that looks a bit of a a mess at the moment, but when it's dry, it'll dry a bit lighter, and um, we can we can proceed with the next stage, which I've already done. So, so here we go. Is a what I did previously. That's the sky, the river, and. Uh, Second stage will be to add in the, the background, the, the mountain and these background hills. So we're going to use what's called <coughs> atmospheric perspective. There's, there's withdrawing, there's linear perspective where things proceed like railway tracks to a vanishing point. Uh, the other one